Good morning. Happy New Year. Yeah, it's great to see you guys. So glad that you're here with us today in worship. Um, those of you watching online, welcome. We're glad to have you with us as well. So let's start off our first Sunday New Year by praising the Lord, okay? So on the count of three, we're going to say praise the Lord, okay? You want to do that with me? Yeah, come on, sure. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Praise the Lord. Woohoo! Awesome. That sounded great. Praise the Lord. He is the only one worthy of praise, and that's what we're here to do today. So thank you for coming. So here at the Heights, our mission, even though we have a new year, it has not changed. Our mission is to love God, love others, and live it out. That's right. So I have a couple ways that you can do that um, today, to love God, love others, and live it out. So first of all, um, back in August, Pastor Raymond um, felt led to call the church to pray. And what he wanted is he wanted someone praying during all of our services. So January, February, March, um, I have a schedule out in guest services. And I would love for everyone, if you feel led, to sign up to pray at one of the services. Okay? There are, I think I counted like 36 options. So 36 services you can choose from. So come to one service to worship and then choose another service to pray at. All right, so if you are interested in joining us to pray, we pray in the prayer room, 8 o'clock, 9.30, 11 o'clock. Just um, sign up at guest services. You can also, if you're watching from home, you can sign up online to pray. Um, the next thing I have for you guys is Heights groups, right? So let's say you've been coming to church for a while and you're like, um, I'm not really sure what my next step is. Well, so one of your next step is to get to be a part of a smaller group. So out in the foyer today... Um, at the family entrance and the guest services at the main entrance, we have uh, these flyers, okay? And they are the Heights Group Church Group Schedule. So inside, you will find a list of all of our current groups and a couple new groups that are going to be starting this coming week. So check those out if you're interested in plugging into a group. Next week, we will have another brochure, and it will actually have some classes that are coming up, okay? Some new classes. So this week, check out our groups. Next week, you'll be able to check out our class schedule as well, okay? And last but not least, a lot of us make New Year's resolutions, right? I mean, we say we don't, but in our minds, it's like, well, I kind of really want to. So I really, I pray, and my hope is that all of us, that we want to be in the Word more this year. Raise your hand if that's you. You want to be in the Word more this year, right? Grow closer in your walk with Christ. So I encourage you to do that. If you don't know where to begin, we actually have these Our Daily Bread devotionals, and they're available out at guest services. This is for the months January, February, March, so you can read, look up scripture, pray, and this is an easy way to guide you if you're not sure where to start, okay? All right, guys, if you will, stand on your feet, and let's worship the Lord. Heights family, we're so glad to see you this morning. You sing with us. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Yeah, my my testimony from death to life His grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my testimony 
Testimony. 
See 
give the Lord a hand of praise this morning as Pastor Raymond comes. Amen. Let's just continue to focus on Jesus and let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for letting us gather ourselves together on the first Sunday of the new year to be able to sing praise to your name. Thank you for the manger. Thank you for sending your one and only son to save us. Thank you for nail-pierced hands. Thank you for an empty tomb. Thank you, Father, that you're coming again. Thank you for the healings you're going to bring into our lives this year. Thank you for the grief that you're going to turn into joy, flames of joy this year. I pray, oh, Father, thank you so very much for the lives that are going to be changed this year. The transformation of marriages and transformation of parent-child relationships and Dear Father, the people that are going to be delivered from their own personal prisons, I thank you for that. I thank you, Father, for every person that's going to come to know you as Savior and Lord this year. I thank you, Father, that you're going to help us endure whatever comes our way. We praise you, Father, for the opportunity to, to shout praise your name, to live it up in our heart and our mind and rejoice in you, for you are God. Thank you for changed lives. Thank you for Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's not something about that name, really and truly. And one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. Let us do it now willingly in worship. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our attitudes that are contrary to your word, our our sins that we've committed in our minds, the sins we committed in our flesh. Forgive us, dear Father, for the times we've chased off after distractions. I ask you, God, now to receive from us our full attention, our focus is on you, and we praise you for what you're going to do in this time as you've already done it. I just ask you to be please be glorified. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, folks, I praising God this week for this church. And the reason is, you know, we came into 2020 and 2020 was probably one of the craziest, darkest years that I've seen. Uh, you, you couldn't meet and y'all were flexible. Uh, it was amazing to me how God just opened up the airways and we were able to reach across the country. Uh, it was amazing to me the number of people I got to meet that are thousands of miles away from here that during that time, God turned around something negative, and made it a positive and, and we came through it. Well, came into 2021 with great hopes, right? We were all, yes, sir. This is going to be it. And 2021, while it was, uh, not quite the year 2020 was this church suffered a lot of loss, sudden loss. A lot of you are sitting here right now. You're, this was a different Christmas for you because this was one of the first Christmas you've had without people that you love. And it's been a tough thing. And now you got this whole scare again that's uh, come about. And there's one thing I know that God is still sovereign. He's still in control. And there's nothing that can come against you and me that he can't see us through. And we came through 2021. We did an awesome job. We ministered to more people than we've ever ministered to in tougher times. That's what it was. And I praise God for you. I really do. I thank God for your willingness to give, your willingness to serve, your willingness to keep moving in this thing. And I'm absolutely convinced with all my heart and soul that this year you're going to see some things that will take your breath. I really do mean that. Because it's just like I was talking to Pastor Max yesterday when we were talking about it. I said, Max, I can't describe it and can't tell you how, but I just know God's moving in a very powerful way and he said, I believe that. I, I feel that myself. And so I, I'm, I'm starting out this first Sunday just saying, hey, it is. It is. God is moving. He is moving. The power of the Holy Spirit is present, and that's exciting to me. And so what I want to do is to remember some things and to be exhorted in some things this morning. And I want to go to the third chapter of Philippians. Third chapter of Philippians. And I want to 
do an introduction to getting to where I'm going to go uh, by looking beginning to verse 1, and we'll get down to where I'll eventually want to go. But uh, I want to start there uh, in Philippians 3, 1. And this is what Paul says um, here. He says, in addition, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write you again about this is no trouble for me and is a safeguard for you. You need to underline, if you have a means to do that, the Bible, rejoice in the Lord. That's his words to a congregation of people that are there in Philippi, people who have given their heart to Christ. He is telling them to rejoice in the Lord. That means that not only for them but for us that uh, he means for us to find our joy in Jesus Christ and him alone. He is the giver of joy. We just looked at saving Christmas one of the day. We found out Jesus is our joy. And that includes our participation in any of the sufferings of Jesus. What's that mean? Well, I'm not just talking about sufferings that we have when somebody is a tragedy or something of that nature. If you're going to stand for the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to stand on his words, trust me, there's going to be people that's going to come after you. It's going to be friends, it's going to be family who will mock you and, and try, to, try to debate you. There's a lot of stuff that goes on when you really stand the truth. And, and it's easy to just kind of camouflage yourself and blend into the scenery. Uh, but Paul, he's wanted to be about Christ and Christ alone. And he then moves into the truth he has to repeat over and over again. Because he says there's no trouble for me to talk about what I've already talked about. And the reason is because there's always individuals that try to destroy the gospel. And he, he, it was true in Philippi then, it's true today. Uh, there's people who try to uh, manipulate, twist the gospel. In verse 2, he starts, watch out for the dogs. Watch out for the evil workers. Watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. And he's talking about here these Jewish people. These are Jewish false teachers who have come into the congregations of people that gather to, to worship God together, who have trusted in Christ uh, for their salvation. And, he is and most of these are Gentiles. The, Philippi the, the Philippians were Gentiles. He comes into these Gentiles and he says, look, you have got, in order to really be uh, saved and in God, you've got to really become Jewish. You've got to become Jewish. Uh, and so you have to obey the Old Testament law to the hilt uh, in addition to your faith in Christ uh, and, or you are not going to know salvation. And what they were doing wasn't working at, for righteousness at all, Paul says, but evil. What they were doing was not righteousness, it was evil. Uh, and it was vicious in that sense. These false teachers only had one interest, and that was making Jew, Jewish individuals out of Gentiles. Paul saw this. He saw what it was, and, uh, and he saw through it, and he saw the theological consequences for those who would submit to this false teaching uh, there. Why? Because it was adding a plus factor to grace, okay? It is, I'm adding a plus factor to grace. It's grace plus something. He saw it. And so when you do that, you eliminate grace altogether. Anytime it's grace plus, okay? Uh, I, I received Jesus Christ as my Savior and Lord, but I've also got to do this, this, this. You've done away with grace. It's no longer a free gift. It's you working your way, having to do certain things in order to gain favor of God. He saw this. And he saw that it's not only eliminating grace, but it's also exchanging that grace for exalting or boasting in a flesh. Look at me. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. Look at, look at what all, you know, I've done this, I've done this, I've never done this, never done this, never done this, but I've done all this. And, and it boasts in the flesh. He talks about that again and makes it even more clear in Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, some of you have memorized this if you've been in church much long, much for such a long time. He says it's for by grace, grace is the free gift of God. It's a gift. 
By grace, you have been saved through faith, right? You hear the gospel, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes to your heart, and you trust Christ and what? He gives you salvation. It's grace. He said, for by grace, you've been saved through faith, and it's not of your own doing. See, it's not of your own doing. They were people this day, and there's people today, I talk to them every week, uh, that believe that it's what I'm doing. You say, yeah, I trusted Christ, but you know, I got to do this, got to do this, got to do this to, in order to continue in his favor. But he says, no, it's not of your own doing. It is a gift, the gift of God. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. No one can boast about their salvation that they have earned. You can boast about what Jesus Christ has done for you. And so, you know, you'll hear me say it a little bit later. You don't work to get to heaven, but you work because you're going to heaven. There's a big difference. You work because of what Christ has done in you. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But he's attacking this. And he needs to. And we need to remember that. It's not grace plus anything. It is the, uh, the sovereign work of God through Christ on the cross. He is the way, the truth, and life, and no one will go to the Father but by him. There, that's, that's the truth. And then in verse 3, he says, for we are, he's talking about me, he said, me, Paul, and all of you believers in Philippi, we are the circumcisions, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God, boast in Christ Jesus, and do not put confidence in the flesh. Look at this. He says, we are the circumcision. We're the true circumcision is what he's saying. The ones who worship by the Spirit of God. God is Spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in what, Jesus say? Spirit, right? So Paul is coming right off of Jesus' words. The ones who wor we are the ones who worship by the Spirit of God. And then he says, there, we boast in Christ Jesus. Our boast is in Jesus. Jesus is who we boast in. And we don't put confidence in the flesh, what I have done. And so in saying we, he's pulling the Jews and the Gentiles together, which is what Jesus Christ did. He tore down the wall of division between people and made us one people. Uh, and the only thing that matters is the blood of Jesus running through us. And that's the thing that he tries to make. And so he puts it on. We are the circumcision. And he's trying to make it clear here that the primary issue is not the Philippians' salvation, but rather their identification as the, as the new people of God under the new covenant. People of God under the new covenant. Listen to Romans 2, 28 and 29, what Paul says. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, skin color. See, we put way too much emphasis on skin color in America, and we got people, that's all they do is emphasize that. If you're judging somebody by the color of their skin, you need to get your life right with Jesus. Right. I'm just telling you that this is, this is anti-Christ to be able to judge by the color of someone's skin. He says, so for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Remember, that was part of the covenant he had with Abraham, right? They would actually do this for the males. It was a physical, fleshly circumcision that showed that they were in the covenant. He says, nah, it's not that. Then he goes on. But a Jew is one inwardly, and, a, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. What's that mean? It's when the Holy Spirit of God comes into our life because we've trusted in Christ and cuts away that sin that's around our heart that governs our heart and sets us free and makes us the people of God. That's what salvation is. That's the reason it's no praise from men, but praise from God. He says this in 2 Corinthians 3, 4 and 6. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything that's coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter, he's talking about the Old Testament law, kills, but the Spirit gives life. And so we're one people, one church, one people, 
all redeemed by the blood of the lamb. It is the grace of God plus nothing. The grace of God plus nothing. So if somebody comes to you and they ask you if you're a believer and you're sitting here right now and you say, yeah, I'm a believer. And they say, well, tell me about it. You don't say, well, you know, I've been a good person. I do this and I do this and I've trusted Christ. I was baptized. No, you've done messed up right there because the, what, the reason you're a believer is that you recognize you couldn't save yourself, that in your own sin, you couldn't do it. And you turn from your sins and trust it alone in Jesus Christ. You got it. That's all you got to say. But, but do you do this and do you do this? I do it, but I do it because I've trusted in Christ. You see what I'm saying? Get it right, man. This is the year to get it right. Why? It, just look at go, what's going on in Canada. Look at what's going on in Canada. There's going to be a ton of preachers going to jail for five years in the next month in Canada. They just, they locking it down because you're either going to be conformed to what we say the, the Bible should say, or you're going to stand by the truth. I'm telling you, this is the year to say, hey, I'm standing in the conviction Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the one and only Savior. There is no other. It's to stand there. You either hold up or you fold up. That's just the way it is. You're going to hold up or you're going to fold up in the coming days. And he says here, the letter kills. The whole point of the Ten Commandments was to show you you can't do it. Because he said, if you break one commandment, you're guilty of all breaking all ten. You're guilty of breaking all ten. You're lost as a ghost. The letter kills. But when you come to know Jesus, the Spirit of God brings life into that which is dead and gives you life like you've never known. That's, that's what he's trying to get across. It's powerful because he knows there's always those who are creeping in trying to add to the gospel or take away from the gospel or rewrite the gospel because they've read something or heard somebody say. But Paul knows nothing of a new Israel. He doesn't know any of that term, new Israel. For him, there's only one people of God who are now newly established in keeping with Old Testament promises on the basis of Christ and the Holy Spirit. And it's by the Holy Spirit in particular that we see in the New Testament that the Gentiles have entered into their inheritance of blessings promised to Abraham. You know, I'm hearing all the time, I've heard preachers on the, on the TV say, I'm tired of these preachers preaching about, you know, this promise here to Jeremiah, it does, it's not for us, it was for them. Boo, hoo, hoo, go back and learn what the Bible says. Because this is what it says in Galatians 3. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on a tree, pointing to the crucifixion. So then in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. All the promises of God are yes in Jesus. Yes in Jesus. And so it's powerful what he's trying to say. Then in verse 3, first part of verse 3, he said, we're just circumcised, the ones who worship by the Spirit of God. I want to go back to that, and the reason is because that worship there is not the word that's used in the Greek New Testament for worship like we just did. It's not the word for corporate worship where we gather and we sing and we pray. It actually is where it's a word where we get our word liturgy. Anybody ever heard that word liturgy? A lot of churches use a liturgy. They've, they've got it a little different anyway. But it's a word that in this day and time actually meant service and devotion. It meant service of God. Uh, service of God's people in terms they're so devoted to him that it's evidence in the life they live. That's what that worship is. We worship him. We live on a daily basis in total devotion to God through Christ. And it's evidenced in that way. It's, it's a service of total devotion. Those redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ, the true circumcised of heart, they live or serve the Lord Jesus in the power of the Spirit. I think of anything in the world for 2022, the church needs to rediscover the Holy Spirit. I mean, we, we've so relegated him to, to the back bends of somewhere, I don't know. We don't even know 
is there a Holy Spirit? You know, when the scripture, they said, we don't know if there is a Holy Spirit. Well, we're still saying that today. We need to get filled up and, uh, to the full overflow of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, be continually filled because it's his power that enables us to live in that devotion, that worship on a daily basis. Let me, let me tell you something. If you're worshiping God in the spirit Monday through Saturday, Sunday, the roof will come off this place. You, you won't be complaining about nothing. You won't be grumbling about nothing. You'll be coming in here. You'll be so caught up in the spirit of God. The roof of this place will come off and people will stop and come in. You say, I, I, really? Well, let me just tell you, I was preaching revival one time. I'd fasted and prayed. My pastor friend pastored and prayed. He fasted. He prayed. Got up in that thing, man. Church had split. People had gotten angry at each other and went off and got down there and started them in another church. That's how Baptists multiply. You know, we just don't like somebody, so we go, we leave and start another one and wonder why God don't bless it, right? And so I stand up there and I was preaching and the Spirit of God just began to move. These people getting saved every night. On Wednesday night of that week, we were praying, and I looked back there and I thought, uh-oh, something's going on. Two state patrolmen come in. One stayed at the back and the other left. I thought, uh-oh. I'm looking around. I'm still preaching, but I'm looking around. I'm just thinking, okay, somebody in here is fixing to do something, and I may need a hymn book to throw at them because that's what they had, right? But here's the thing. When I got to the invitation, the power of God was moving in an awesome way. When I got down there, here comes through, the, through, through from the back, not the state patrolman that was back there, but here come the other one who had already come in with a, a young teenage boy with him. And he come down here, and this is what he said to me. We were riding by the church, and it looked like the church was on fire. So we drove into the parking lot and got out of our car to come in here to see what was happening. And we come in here, and y'all were having services. And he said, I got to thinking... I want my son in on this, so I went and, and, and told, told him I needed to go home for a minute. I went and got my son. I brought him back here and want you to know we both want to trust Christ as our Savior and Lord. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That's the revival that went on for a week. They stopped it because they're scared. You ever been scared? This, to, to, here it was. God, that thing got it. People's everywhere. I came home and they called back and said, well, can you fly back up here? I said, yeah, I'll fly back up there. And we went back at it, went another thing until they couldn't stand it no more. See, this is what I'm talking about. It's about Jesus and him alone. It's not about religion. It's not about religious things. It's about Jesus Christ and being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And today is the day to say no more of this religious stuff. Jesus. This is what Paul is getting to see. He, he understands. He says, Paul says, there's only two ways of existing in that verse. He says, you can be centered on the flesh or you can be centered on the spirit. If you're going to be centered on the spirit, you'll be the eschatological people. What's that mean? People who are looking for Jesus to come. Everything you're doing, you're looking for Jesus to be able to come. And that means as believers in Christ, we embrace the best this world has, it's sure. But as long as it's understood in light of the cross, what we do in this world, we do always looking to Jesus. And true service and devotion to God is that which has been prompted by the Holy Spirit of God, where through life in the Spirit, the believer boasts in Christ, as Paul said. We boast in Christ which then brings an end to the flesh. Because how many of you know, your biggest enemy ain't the devil, it's you. <laughs> it's that old flesh that rears up and wants to do its thing. That's our biggest enemy, it really is. He says, boast in Christ Jesus and do not put confidence in the flesh. Now, the boasting has to do with putting one's confidence and full trust in and thus the glory in Jesus, not of the works of the law, we put our trust in him and 
count on his righteousness that he's given to us. And so Christ Jesus, by his death on the cross, has brought us into this relationship with the sovereign God through sheer grace. And the goal of the Old Testament law becomes realized because that's the whole purpose of the Old Testament is to point us to Jesus, to tell us, number one, you sin, you can't save yourself, but there's one coming that can. It's the whole point of the Old Testament. And so we're walking in that. And so in Galatians Paul says this, he says, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or hearing by a faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? He said, look, your flesh, is, your flesh can't help you get where you want to be. You can't help you become the person that God continued you to be. And I'm telling you, there's so many people that are going to get to the end of their life and they're going to have realized they missed out on so much because they weren't all in in Jesus. It was too much of the flesh in this thing. Just stay with me on this. He goes on in verse 4 and 6. He wants to, he's going to act foolish himself now. He says, although I have reasons for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has grounds for confidence in the flesh, I have more. So he's talking to Jews who are trying to get the Gentiles to become Jews. Listen to what he says. I'm circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, regarding the law, a Pharisee, regarding zeal, persecuting the church, regarding the righteousness of any law, blameless. Paul says, you want to talk about a pedigree of good works and righteous things that ought to be able to redeem me? Here it is. And it was astounding. Anyone who had heard that would say, my land, he's, he's got what I wish I had, that kind of pedigree, that kind of inheritance, right? But then what's he say? I, this is what gets me. He sets them up right there, and this is what he says in verse 7. But everything that was gained to me I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. Everything. What? He, he says, everything I have. What, 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 what was he talking about here? Man, he's talking about all that pedigree he had there, right? And then he goes on. He says, um, but everything that was gained to me, I've considered to be lost because of Christ. More than that, I consider everything to be a loss in view of surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, Jesus, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain, may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him, Jesus, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Paul says, look, all this stuff that I've, I've just given you, he says it's dung. It's dung. Man, that's a, that's, a, that's a bad word. I couldn't say it in here. Paul said, man, I, it, it, that's what it is. That's what I'd have done when I was telling him. It, this is what it is. I've been keeping a dog all weekend, so I know what I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying. He said, it's a loss. Why? Because of Jesus. Jesus. He said, when you get to know Jesus, the surpassing knowledge of knowing him, there's nothing to compare. That's why I'm saying that if we have one thing, one goal, it should be to know Jesus. You say, well, I do know Jesus. Is knowing him surpassing anything else you know or experience? See, this is, this is where it comes from and where I'm headed. Just hang with me. He, he, says, he says to know Christ, he says, means to know the power of the resurrection. That's new life. And that's the power that comes based on Christ's resurrection. Because this is what the Word says. The same power, Paul says, that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and me in Christ. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, the same power. This was to go read your Bible. Read it. Read the New Testament. Read Paul's letters. Read the gospel. 
He says, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you and me as believers in Christ. It is powerful. Everything else that others may have considered of value in the present age, religious advantages or status or material benefits, honor, comforts, all those things are a total loss in comparison, in comparison with Christ. It's, simply, it's just simply because of Christ that Paul says, I consider everything in, in my past back here. All the accolades you could give me are, are, are lost. They're nothing. They mean nothing anymore to me because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In verse 10, he clarifies knowing Christ. It does not mean to have not head knowledge about him. That's what he wants to make sure in verse 10, but to know him personally and relationally. You see, when I'm talking about knowing Jesus and coming to have him as your savior, I'm not talking about a head knowledge. Now you're going to have it, right? But you're talking about a family relational love. My, my daughter and myself, <clears throat> one of my daughters last night, we were talking, we talked about 30 minutes so when it's, we was talking about my life and where I was growing up and the things that I wrestled with. And, and I, I, was, I was telling her, I said, but he, here's the thing. She said, okay, what is it? She said, I said, I love you and your sister and my grandkids and your mama so very much that if someone tried to hurt you or them, I think I would have a real hard time keeping that old man from coming back and even in a score. I'm not happy about that, but that's how much I love you. I love you so much that I would give my life for you, okay? Now, I meant that. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, when I came here, I, I made it known. I told this committee, I said, listen, I know people talk about preachers and everything. I know they do. You, they say anything they want to about me, I'm good with it. I handle it. But make sure you tell everybody, don't say nothing about my wife or my girls, or you'll be wishing you didn't know me. Is that because you don't have the spirit of God in you? No, it's something God's working on. I'm just trying to get you to see that if you love your kids and your kids love you, you have that, that bond. This is the kind of knowing he's talking about. It is a, a intimate love relationship between you and Jesus where that you want to get to know him more and more just as he already knows you. You want to know him like he already knows you. And listen, I, I grew up in the landline. And when, when I started dating Janet, I was trying to get her to marry me when she was 15. I look at now and I'm thinking, man, what was you doing? I said, I, I just, I'd get on the phone. I didn't want to hang up. She'd actually hand the phone off to her girlfriend and say, you talk to him. <laughs> what a disappointment. Not that I didn't love her friend, but I, where, where's Janet? Oh, she's sitting over here. I can just see her now, you know. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why did I want to talk to her? Because I loved her to pieces. I went to Western Carolina. I'd leave on Wednesday and come home. She'd come home from high school and I'd have a new bicycle. I went and bought one, put it in her driveway. She'd say, aren't you supposed to be in school? I said, don't tell mama. <laughs> I couldn't stand it. Why? I wanted to be with her. Now listen, this kind of love is what this means. It, it, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio on this thing, but what I'm trying to get you to see is that if all you've got is a head knowledge, you ain't got a whole lot. But if you get into that intimate relationship where you know that you know Jesus and that life transforming power of his resurrection is in you and you want to spend time with him, you will find your world turned upside down. And that's what I'm asking God to give us this year. It has to do with personal experience and intimate relationship. Somehow, some people get thrown off, he says, somehow I attain. <clears throat> he's not doubting he's going to get to the resurrection. He's just saying this. Somehow, either here on this earth when Jesus comes 
or, or when I get there with him. He's talking about that's when it's all going to come. That's what he means. He's not doubting anything. But then we get to what I really want to, to talk about. So that's a, that was a short introduction to where I want to get, okay? Because this is, this is, how many of you have already, has everybody here gave up on resolutions? Yeah, right. We all know they don't work, do they? We get, <laughs> yeah. yes, sir. How many Pelotons will be sitting holding up clothes by February, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Ride with me. Shirts jumping up and down on hangers, you know what I'm saying right there? It's, it's right there, you know. There was those weights over there, now they're holding up the bookcase, you know. It, it's just kind of thing. We always make them. But I'm going to tell you, there is one that you do need to make. I mean, we all got them. I've got mine, right, my brother? We got, we got, I got mine. I got people who want to help me with mine. But, but here's the thing. Listen to what Paul says and listen carefully. He says in verse 12 to 14, not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I have also been taking hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Paul says right here, he says, man, one thing. Down in verse 13, he, he, you know, he's, he's, my brother says, I, can submit, I consider myself no, taking hold of it. No, but one thing. The I do is added in there just because it makes better sense. But actually what Paul, he's, Paul's going along and saying, I haven't really attained it. I've not really got there. I'm not perfect. But one thing, one thing, it's emphatic. One thing, he's like, he says, man, I got to get to the point. One thing. And that's, that's what I want us to hear. I want us to know what salvation is and what that relationship looked like. But here he begins. Six times in those verses, he uses his own personal pronoun, I. I, six times. And that's important. Why? Because in those verses, Paul is getting transparent and honest as you can be in humility before all the people who's going to read those letters, including you and me. He's bearing his soul. He's making it known who he is. And that intro that I've just gone through was to get to this one thing, which is important as we stand here and sit here at the beginning of a new year to enter into what Paul says in verses 13 and 14 that, that we may not give up. I, I don't want anybody to waste their life. I don't want anyone to waste their life, to come to the end of it and realize they've wasted their life. They're wasting it. You know, I, I was showing Janet, I, I was just kind of remembering Calvin Hunt. If you remember Calvin, Calvin was a Grammy Award winner for the uh, uh, singing with uh, Brooklyn Tab. And we were blessed to have him here. And we got to spend some time together. And I was just thinking, it's just on my mind. He died a couple of years ago of cancer, I think it was. Body had taken a hit. And I was telling Janet, we was watching a video of him singing free at last and I was telling her I said Janet you know he had his little testimony in there and he was talking about how he was a crackhead and had a good family but he just couldn't leave the crack alone and it was just it was call his name and he's sleeping in dog houses and he'd be gone four and five days at a time and spending his money just it was just crazy and how he came home one day and his his wife who gave her testimony and she said, man, you know, I realized I had to fast and pray. I had to get serious this thing with Jesus. And so he came home on a Tuesday and she wasn't there. So he went to sleep and he slept and he woke up and he said, he just felt like somebody asked where, somewhere his wife was and they said, she's down at the church. So he said, I'd just go down there and jerk her out of there. And he said, he walked in the church and there was all these people gathered down praying and all they could hear was God save Calvin. God save Calvin. And he said he started walking down through there and his wife looked up and the preacher looked up and said, and there he is. And he fell to his knees and trusted in Christ as his Savior and as his Lord. He trusted in him as his Savior and his Lord. 
And, and he said, you know, he said, God changed my life at that moment. He became a Grammy Award winner, but he didn't do it for the Grammy. He did it for the glory of God. And one thing he said to me on the way to the airport when I was taking him back to Lee, he said, I think often how close I came to wasting my life. I don't want nobody to waste their life. I don't want you to waste it whether it's a job or whether it's whatever it is. I don't want nobody to waste their life. I want you to cross the finish line and enter right into the very presence of Jesus and hear him say, well done, well done. I, I want you to succeed. And that begins here, begins here. Paul clarifies with humility and transparency that he's not arrived spiritually. He says, man, I've not got it all together yet. He, he's, he's not already been made perfect in this earth life. I mean, positionally he has, but it's only when you and I experience the resurrection of Jesus Christ and are in heaven forever that you and I are going to know no more scars. And then what I say, no scars in heaven. The only scars in heaven will be on the hands that hold you now. Thank God for that, right? But that's what it is. Uh, he, 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 this truth, rather than discouraging him, that he hasn't arrived, that he hasn't, he hasn't finally arrived. And I get nervous around people who think they've arrived or I don't need to do anymore. I just need to stop now and just coast. I, I've done all. No, no. He's, it, it motivated him to press on toward God's goal for his life, God's goal. And whenever you're feeling discouraged or sluggish in the Christian life, I tell you to go back and read these verses, verse 13, 14. Because here's the thing, none of us have arrived and we need to get on God's goal and get this thing rolling in the direction to glorify him. And so I don't know how many of you have ever run a race or not, but, but running is, is, is really uh, a running a good race takes a lot of preparation to be able to do it and a lot of focus and a lot of perseverance. I never have liked to run, but that's all I've done. <laughs> Coach McDonald with the Little Red Raiders every day. John's, give me, give me three down Davis Park. Outside the light poles, three is a mile. I'd come back in and it would be five minutes. John's, give me three around the light poles. And I was just thinking the whole time I run, I hate to run. And then we'd run wind sprints. We'd run wind sprints. And then I got to junior high. It was junior high when I was, that's how old I am. And I played football, basketball, wrestled, played baseball, and he asked me to run track and throw the shot put. And so I'd never run track a day in my life. I'd barely do a shot put. I was stout enough, but run and race. And he wanted to put me in a... Um, relay race you know where you got the baton and he said i don't think you're the fastest so we don't want you to be the the anchor you, you're gonna probably be first i said okay so you know my problem was the whole time i was running i was doing this <laughs> and i'd run off the track i really would i'd be over there in the weeds you know somewhere and i had to get back on R running a race it takes a lot of exertion. It takes a lot of focus. You can't, you, you have to be aware of distractions. And by the way, that was my last race. <laughs> my one race. John, you can go back and play baseball. Okay, thank you. But from start to finish, you have to be aware of distractions. You don't look back, you don't turn around or whatever. And the Bible compares the Christian life to a race. It's not, a, it is not a sprint, it, it is a marathon. Christian race is a marathon, is what it is. And it, it's not that 100-yard dash. Uh, it's not a walk in the park. You and I know that right now. I don't even have to convince you of that. Uh, it's a daily challenge, this race we're in called life. It, it requires focus and effort and perseverance to keep overcoming the obstacles that come in our way. But you in Christ are a long distance runner filled with the spirit. And that requires that you maintain the right focus to keep going. And so Paul's focus here in his passage is on what lies ahead rather than what lies behind. In fact, he strains 
toward what is ahead. Strains with every bit of his power. Reaching out is actually the way it, it seems. He presses toward the goal, which is the prize of, of which God has called him heavenward in Jesus Christ. You can't be passive in your Christian life. This is what he says in his verses. You can't be passive. You need to keep a forward focus. You need to keep motivated to persevering and keep growing in Christ. You need to keep pressing for the goal. You need to get the goal clear in your head. And, and he shares with us three ways we do that. First is make God's goals your own goals. He does that in verse 12. And the first step is this. You just make God's goals your own goals. Look at it. Not that I've already reached the goal or I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold by Christ Jesus. If you're going to press forward towards the goal that God has for you, you've got to begin to know what his goal is. What is it? It's to live your life in the fullness of life to give him glory, to be found faithful, to be found faithful, to give glory. That's what he's called you and me to do, to be able to share the gospel of Christ wherever we go. It's part of it. Find those goals. But in order to begin that, you have to get real about where you are in your Christian walk. You've got to, with the same humility and the same honesty and transparency, is look into your life. I, I've been working with addicts and, and people all, since I've been in the ministry. That was my ministry 37 years ago. And what I discovered very early without even nobody having to teach me is until a human being decides to own who they are and where they are, no one can ever be helped. You won't even come to know Christ unless you know yourself honest enough to say, I don't, right? And so you've got to be honest with where it is. I mean, it's there. Paul, Paul doesn't claim that he's perfect. He's... He, he's not got it made as a Christian. He's not already arrived. He's not in heaven. He can't sit back is what he said. I can't sit back now and just watch everything. I've got to get up and go. I've got to keep on moving and keep on preaching and keep on teaching and keep on sharing. I can't let the world beat me down. And he realizes he's still on a journey. And he's going to be on that journey either until he breathes his last breath or Jesus Christ comes. And he shares that honestly with Philippians. Too often today, we think that, well, I'm the only Christian that struggles with this, so I just want to keep it to myself because I know there's nobody else struggles. Are you kidding me? That's what always used to amaze me in, in when you had Celebrate Recovery small groups. You know, somebody comes in kind of timid, and all of a sudden somebody says, well, I struggle with that. You, you struggle with that? You're a leader. Yeah, yeah I, I, I struggle with that. And the next thing you know, this person says, I, I, that's me. That's what happened to me. You see, our stories, we're in the same life. You'd be surprised how many other people are struggling where you may be struggling. You've got to be honest with God about that. Uh, and, and we're struggling about that. I, I can never share my struggle, Pastor, but, uh, but with others because they'd never understand. Oh, yes, we will. Oh, yes, we will because we're all struggling with one thing or another. Uh, I don't know anybody that's arrived yet. I, I really don't. I, I don't. I haven't met any perfect people. One of the things I used to say when I first came here, and, and I quit saying it, uh, but I said to people, I said, if you're looking for the perfect church and you find it, don't join it because it won't be perfect no more. You see, there's no such thing as a perfect church. It's really not because we're all imperfect people. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I know, I'm, I was telling Max yesterday, I've been serving the Lord a long time, and I'm still learning from the Word of God. I mean, I, I, told, I, I, I was just sitting there and said, God, if I had a million lifetimes, I don't think I could, I could kind of get to the depths of your Word just in the Word of God. I mean, reading through the Bible year after year, Every year, something else God shows me, and I'm just blown away, and I'm thinking, God, I'm running out of time. I, I want to know everything I can know about it. I'm learning all the time. I'm learning from people. I'm learning in situations. There's nobody that's arrived. I, I certainly haven't. We have to be honest where we are in our walk and help other people be honest too. 
How many of you have ever tried to share with somebody and they condemned you? Shut that off right quick, didn't it? <laughs> I'm telling you. You're going, well, you know, I, was, I thought you was a Christian. Well, excuse me, Mr. Righteousness. <laughs> Can I delineate your flaws? Right? Now, you just shut up, right? It becomes antagonistic. But then, secondly, you've got to align your goals with God's goal for your life. I press hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. God grabbed Paul, right? He grabbed Paul, introduced himself to him in a mighty powerful way, right? Blindness and light. That's, that's how he got to meet Jesus. But he grabbed him because why? He didn't want to, he, he showed him, listen, I got a purpose for you. You're going to be a light to the Gentiles. You're going to do, this is what you're going to do. And Paul, Paul took it and went for it. Um, Ephesians 2.10 says this, that you and I were created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, the reality is that you don't work to get to heaven, as I said a little bit ago. You work because you're going to heaven. You see, every single person here, listen, God's not waste. He, you're not a waste. Don't let anybody tell you, well, all I do is I just do this. I say, no, God has given you gifts. He's given you abilities. He's given you talents. He's given you experiences that maybe somebody else doesn't have that exact experience. He wants you to use them purposely to help other people reach Jesus and start using their gifts and talents for the glory of God. It's a purpose, and those are the works he knew. Because, you know, people say, how'd God know? He's God. He knows everything. And because he knows everything, do you not know that he knows already who's in, who's out? He wants us to know and to use what he's given us for his glory and for his honor. He has a purpose, but in order to fulfill that, he has to grab hold of you. And this is what I'm wanting first and foremost to grab hold of you in that intimate love relationship where it's not just a head knowledge, where it's just not like, well, you know, I don't know if I want to go to church or not. Man, it's get up and go. Get up and go. It's that kind of thing. You know, you've heard me say, man, you ask my wife, when I got saved, come hell or high water, I was going to church. It didn't matter what anybody said. And she'd always say, why do we have to wait after church to go to the beach? I said, man, I ain't missing church. I'm going to, I'll go to the beach afternoon. But one Easter, all right, let's go to the beach. We went to the beach. She was pregnant. Man, I've never seen the like of my life. My, the first thing I did was got hit in the back end by four teenage girls drunk as a coop. They was all about 16, 17, drunk, run right in the back of me. That was an awful thing. Then we got to the hotel, and there was fights going on, people fighting out in front of the room, people going up and down the, the strip in vans with 55-gallon barrels of pot smoking them. And I thought, man, I've done, I left Sodom and Gomorrah to come to Jesus. Now I've done run back to Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> and here we go back to the hotel room, and two guys out there, fighting it up and her pregnant and I just reached in my pocket and I said I hate this and I just pulled my knife out and I said let's go and then I thought see what happens when you go back to Sodom and Gomorrah click it right back up I told Janet I said never again <laughs> never again are we going to be down here in Sodom while the, we should be worshiping God it's just one of those things, folks, what I'm just trying to tell you. There's a different relationship when Jesus is that real to you. And this is what Paul said. Get yourself lined up with what he wants you to do. Walk close with God. And I promise you, if you begin to walk close with him, he will lead you where he wants you to go, and it will be an absolute blessing and a surprise to some of you how God will use you. So that's the first step. But then the second is verse 13 and 14. He says this, keep a forward focus at all times. Now listen, if you want to look back, look back in your memory at what God has done. Don't look back at things that have happened. Look and remember what God has done. 
That's what I'm going to say because in a minute you're going to hear me say something that's going to sound like I'm nullifying remembering. I'm not. You can't run well looking backward. That's what I tried to get you to say a while ago. You can't drive forward looking in the rearview mirror. And this is what I've been saying since I've been here, that some of you don't have a front windshield anymore. All you've got is a big rearview mirror, and all you can see is what's behind you. And it's no wonder you keep running off the road and not, not finding life going forward. You're stuck in a moment. You're stuck in a moment. And so what Paul says... Three things. He said, get rid of the distractions. He says, get rid of it. Verse 3, brother says, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold, but one thing, and, and he had a lot of things I know going on in his life, but he says, one thing, what is it? Get rid of the distractions. Things that distract you from your walk in Jesus is one of the primary concerns you should have beginning right now. To make sure that as you go throughout this year, we don't know what's coming. None of us know that we'll be here a week from now, much less the end of this year. But here's the thing. You need to get rid of the distractions, the weights that keep you from running the race, fully looking at Jesus. You need to, you need to get rid of them. You need to back them away, reprioritize your life. That's what he's saying. He can only focus on one thing. One thing I do. He got rid of the distractions. He kept his focus on Jesus, you know. I don't know how many things you do. I don't know how many hats you may wear. Uh, if you're like most of us, you do a lot of different things and you get pulled in a lot of different directions and it's hard to focus when you're pulled in so many th different ways. But you, you can't even run a good race when you're distracted from the goal. That's the truth. Um, a lot that we, uh, we do is good, but is it necessary? You see, that's, that's a distraction, doing good things sometimes that are not necessary. There are many things in our life that are good, but they're just distractions. They keep us from being the people that God has called us to be, where he's first in our life. We need to get rid of those distractions. And so in the midst of our busy schedules, we need to be able to say with Paul one thing. This is our governing thing. Everything else falls under one thing, and that is my focus is on Jesus Christ. And, and so then he says, forget what is behind and strain to what is ahead. One thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead. Verse 13. When, the, when you run the race, the last thing you want to do is get back. I don't know how many of you keep up with the racing, but there's a guy named John Landy and another guy named Roger Bannister. They were the uh, first two individuals in history to run a mile under four minutes. And in 1954, the British games in Vancouver, they raced each other. And it was an amazing, they called it the miracle mile because this was something, two men who had run the first mile under four minutes. Uh, and Landy, who had set the record first, and it was a, a great record, was actually winning the race. He was beating Roger Bannister when he made one critical mistake, and they got it on film, and I think they made a statue out of it. But, but Bannister, uh, um, uh, Landy was running on the left, and, and uh, Roger was running over to his right. He thought he was behind him. So right when he's getting to the line, he does this, looks back. And Bannister run by him and beat him by eight-tenths of a second. And, and, and Bannister said, I mean, Bannister couldn't believe it. Landy looked over and he said, eight tenths of a second. That's how long it took me to turn my head and look back. I, I'm just telling you, if you want to lose the race, keep your focus back here. Keep your focus back here. That's not what Paul says. You can't live life that way. There were three people that uh, in Luke's gospel, Jesus came up on. He said, follow me. He kept telling them, follow me. And they all made excuses. They all said, well, I can't follow you right now. Uh, and each one of them gave their excuse. One person said, well, I just got married. Yeah. I got some land I bought. I hadn't seen it yet. I don't go see it. Sounds like the old swap land trick, right? I got some swamp land you want to buy. Yeah, okay, give me the money. They all had excuses. And this is what Jesus said in Luke 9, 67. He said, Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. 
See, they were all making excuses. We, you just don't know. We got to go. Now, listen, listen. Jesus Christ is calling us upward. He is calling us upward. Ours is to run the race with everything we have with God as our goal set before us and everything we do in our life is about him. And we do not look back. We keep moving until we cross that line and look at him face to face. Then we will know it's all been worthwhile. We're human beings. We look at things as humans do. We do not know the mind of God. He said, my understanding is higher than your understanding. And sometimes we let that be a look back for us or a rearview mirror. You can't do that. If you look back and it keeps you from following Jesus, if it keeps you moving forward in Christ, if it keeps you from being a witness to others, you need to, you need to change that. You need to move away from that distraction and reprioritize your life. Some people are so caught up on their past successes and their past achievements and accomplishments that instead of serving God in the present, they just take comfort in maybe how they've served him in the past or how good the things they've done here and there. Churches do this a lot. We do. But realize that God still has work for you and me to do. It's not all back here. It's all back here. It's, it's not. It's not. Don't ever settle for being a has-been. Don't, don't do that. There's no has-beens in the Christian life. No room for it. Only people who God wants to use now in the present. He still wants to use you. I don't care how old you are, what your health's like. God wants to use you. Other people have the opposite problem. Instead of looking at successes, they're looking at their failures. They're looking at their worries. They're looking at their fears and, and, and they, uh, the attacks of the enemies and, and the praise of our friends. You know, we just need holy amnesia. We need holy amnesia. Uh, yeah, you failed God in the past, so now, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'll just fail again. No, not if you give it all in to Jesus. I just want to encourage you this morning, if that's you, because first of all, if you're, if you're in Christ, know that God's forgiven you. There is therefore now no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Why are you still in that prison? You realize that you can go to C-R-N-A-A-A and any other uh, initial you want to use, and it can never set you free from the prisons that you're in. It can help you, but without Jesus, you will never be the person you were meant to be. I don't care how good it is. That's right. Just going to tell you right now, I've been doing this for 37 years. I can tell you now, if you, you know, oh yeah, I do this and I do this and I do this. Well, let me tell you something. Get in Jesus and then that thing will really take off and you'll understand you're no longer in a prison that has got you where you are anyway. Stop looking back at those things you've been forgiven. And secondly, no, God has still work for you to do. I don't think it's too late until you breathe your last breath. I mean, he is the God of the second chance, the third chance, the fourth chance, the fifth chance, the sixth chance, the seventh chance. Yeah, he does. He, he gives us those opportunities to be able to, to honor him. He'll use your past failures if you let him to minister in the present. He really will. If you keep looking backwards, you'll never go forward. You just won't do it. So as Christians, we need some holy amnesia. And that word strain he used means to exert yourself to the uttermost. And that's what it is. Faith is not a decision you've made in the past that just is retro forward in this. Faith is something that you're developing day after day after day. It's spending time with God. It's spending time in his word. It's spending time talking to God. It's spending time worshiping with others. In Luke 18, 8, listen to what Jesus says about when he comes back, okay? Everybody's talking about, is Jesus coming back? Let me tell you what he's looking for when he comes back. This is what he said. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Will he find faith? Faith is that which not only believes in him mentally, but it is surrendering of life. Jesus is coming back. He's just interested. He said, will I find faith? He knows the answer. But the reality is it's something that we're developing. 
And that brings me to the last part. It says he presses on toward the goal, the prize, which is Jesus in his presence forever. I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. God had called him to his ultimate joy. Paul knew what waited him. He said, you know, I'm going to receive an award. My time of my departure is at hand. I've run the race. I fought the fight. And, and there's nothing left for me now but the prize that awaits me. He couldn't wait. He said, I want to go be with Jesus now. You know, and that would be better for me. But me stay be better for you because you need somebody to encourage you. But you see, he had an upper cost and he knew this. This earth's not all there is. This earth is all not all there is. And let me just say to all of you that's lost loved ones here this past year, listen to me. If your loved ones knew Jesus Christ, I'm telling you no matter how much you love them or no matter how much they love you, if you could look up to them right now and say, would you come back and be with us? We can't do it without you. They would say, no, I'll wait till you get here. I promise you that's the case. They're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, when you've seen Jesus, you, it may take you 10,000 years before you even know anybody else is there. Huh? I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing so-and-so and so-and-so. How about Jesus. He's the one that makes us, it makes it possible for us to be there. And I promise you, when we see him, will we stand? Will we sing? Will we, I, I don't know. I can't see myself doing nothing but laying flat on my face and just, wow, knocked out by it, you see. And this is what Paul is saying. This, this verse is about perseverance and personal, purposeful living. I mean, what good is it to run a race if you drop out at the finish line? You're almost there, and all of a sudden you say, nothing's gone my way. Wow. Paul says, what happened to you? You was running a race so good, and all of a sudden now it's like you've been bewitched. Now you're over here chasing over something else. What, what's going on? I'm telling you, this world is coming after you as a believer, me as a pastor and a believer, it's already happening in places. Just telling you it is. Unless Jesus does a mighty revival, it's coming. And my thing is, I want you to hold up, not fold up. Keep your eyes on the goal. Focus on the finish line. Remember what this race is all about. Keep your eyes on the prize. What happens in a race as you get closer to the finish line? What do you do? Do you slow up? You get faster, right? I'm wanting to kick it in. I'm wanting to kick it in spiritually. I don't want to stop. I want to kick it in. I want to go high gear. I want to drop her down into fourth, and let's, let's see if we can roll some tires. I, I want to be able to see. I want it to be. I don't want it to say, no, I, I, I'm done. I'm done. No, I want to go, man. Let's get this thing going. Let's take as many people as we can with us into the kingdom. Get rid of those distractions. Listen to me, parents. Even if your kids get scholarships to the greatest schools in America, play pro ball, if they don't know Jesus and live for him, what good is it? What, what good is it? What, what good is it if we give everything that we've got and, and they never have a want, but they, have Je they don't have Jesus? You see, here's my thing. This is the year right now that we need one thing, and that is to start in Christ, full of the Holy Spirit, living and running this race to the glory of God. And I challenge you, read the New Testament through. Just start today. Just start Genesis, just Rev, uh, uh, Revelation. I'm reading the Bible through, and I just say, read the New Testament. Matthew to Revelation. Read it through. And uh, if you want to, to read the whole Bible through, we can get you a, a program, show you how, how to read it. Read it. And in the passages you get to that say, man, that don't even make sense. Why did this happen? Those are the good kinds of things you talk about and you have questions about study the word pray pray 
And I'm telling you, I'm hoping, I'm believing that God's going to lead us to do some fasting in this church where we're going to have days of fasting and we'll come together and pray and I think we're going to pray the walls of the devil down and set some people free. Because I do, just like I prayed beginning, I believe there's some people here, you got family members, God's getting ready to set them free. You get ready. It's coming. There's some things going to happen that's going to take our breath. We don't understand it all and I can't predict it. I, I don't know. I just know God is moving. And if we would just get all up in him, full of the spirit, one thing, running the race, getting rid of the distractions, focusing on him with God's goal as our goal, guess what? We win. Some of you have slowed down. Let me tell you, pick the pace back up. Pick the pace back up. Pick it back up. Let this be the day. You can rest later. Pick it up. Some of you have yet to enter the race. You're still trying to decide whether you know Jesus or not. Listen, get all into him. Just trust him. It, 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 there's nothing better I'd love to see to some people who have been on the fence come to trust Jesus and start to 2022 all in for Christ. Watch what will happen. This is going to be a year to remember for good things. I believe that. Would you stand with me? I got people that are going to be standing down here. If you've never trusted Christ, your Savior and Lord, listen, I wish you'd come, let them talk with you just a minute, pray with you. It's the greatest decision that any human being ever makes. Some of you may just need to come down here uh, with family or whatever and pray. Make a new commitment to run this race with your focus on Jesus, with God as your, as, a, as that, and that finish line. That's, that's what the goal is. Make it a commitment. Make it a prayerful commitment so that when you walk out of here, you will begin to see how great and mighty God is. How God is. Let's pray. Father, with such urgency within me, I don't know I don't even know how to describe it. God, you understand it. I, I'm just warning the people that are gathered here and the people watching, people I love, people I care for, not to drop out of this race, not to run this race poorly by distractions and heavy weights that they're carrying around. I can't make anybody trust you, God. I can't make anybody believe what it, your gospel says. I can't make anybody make new commitments, but God, your Holy Spirit can knock on their door and you can lead them to make those decisions on this day they need to make. Oh, Father, let us run this race as a church like we've never run it before. Oh, God, help us to hold up, not fold up. Help us to keep on going, keep on running, keep us from looking back. And if we're going to look back, let it be a memory of how you worked in the past, just like the, they used to remember you, God, splitting the Red Sea. They said, oh, God, we split the Red Sea. But don't let us get so hung up on it that like, God, that we don't let you split the seas we need split today. We got to look forward. And so, God, I'm praying that you raise up some people, families, individuals, couples, young adults, teenagers, even, even children, God, that are coming in an intimate love relationship with you, and they're going to run this thing wide open. Thank you for how you've led us the last two years. Thank you how you've led us minister more than to more people than we could ever imagine and we've not even touched the surface of what you're going to do we make those commitments to you right now i'm just going to wait just a minute if anybody wants to come to pray you come just one more minute and we're going to quit close
Father God, I just thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the patience of everybody in here as we worship you, dear God, and thank you for allowing me to be able to just share my heart. The urgency I have right now, God, is overwhelming. Help us begin this day to live like we've never lived before for you. And I pray, dear God, that you would take us in your spirit in this church. And dear God, we would change our county and our state because of you. Not what we do, but what you do through us. To you be all the glory, all the majesty, all the honor, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you for staying and being with me. God bless you. I'll call you this.